Keeping Close to Home, Class and Education by Bell Hooks. We are both awake in the almost dark of 5 a.m. Everyone else is sound asleep. Mama asks the usual questions, telling me to look around, make sure I have everything, scolding me because I am uncertain about the actual time the bus arrives. By 5.30, we are waiting outside the closed station. Alone together, we have a chance to really talk. Mama begins. Angry with her children, especially the ones who whisper behind her back, she says bitterly, your childhood could not have been that bad. You were fed and clothed. You did not have to do without. That's more than a lot of folks have. And I just can't stand the way y'all go on. The hurt in her voice saddens me. I have always wanted to protect Mama from hurt, to ease her burdens. Now I am part of what troubles. Confronting me, she says accusingly, it's not just the other children. You talk too much about the past. You don't just listen. And I do talk. Worse, I write about it. Mama has always come to each of her children seeking different responses. With me, she expresses a disappointment, hurt and anger of betrayal, anger that her children are so critical, that we can't even have the sense to like the presents she sends. She says, from now on, there will be no presents. I'll just stick some money in a little envelope the way the rest of you do. Nobody wants criticism. Everybody can criticize me, but I'm supposed to say nothing. When I try to talk, my voice sounds like a 12 year old. When I try to talk, she speaks louder, interrupting me, even though she has said repeatedly, explain it to me, this talk about the past. I struggle to return to my 35 year old self so that she will know by the sound of my voice that we are two women talking together. It is only when I state firmly in my very adult voice, mama, you are not listening, that she becomes quiet. She waits. Now that I have her attention, I fear that my explanations will be lame, inadequate. Mama, I begin. People usually go to therapy because they feel hurt inside, because they have pain that will not stop, like a wound that continually breaks open, that does not heal. And often, these hurts, that pain has to do with things that have happened in the past, sometimes in childhood, often in childhood, or things that we believe happened. She wants to know, what hurts? What hurts are you talking about? Mom, I can't answer that. I can't speak for all of us. The hurts are different for everybody. But the point is you try to make the hurt better, to heal it by understanding how it came to be. And I know you feel mad when you say something happened or hurt that you don't remember being that way. But the past isn't like that. We don't have the same memory of it. We remember things differently. You know that. And sometimes folk feel hurt about stuff and you just don't know or didn't realize it, and they need to talk about it. Surely you understand the need to talk about it. Our conversation is interrupted by the sight of my uncle walking across the park toward us. We stop to watch him. He is on his way to work dressed in a familiar blue suit. They look alike, these two who rarely discuss the past. This interruption makes me think about life in a small town. You always see someone you know. Interruptions, intrusions, are part of the daily life. Privacy is difficult to maintain. We leave our private space in the car to greet him. After the hug and kiss he has given me every year since I was born, they talk about the days as funerals. In the distance, the bus approaches. He walks away knowing that they will see each other later. Just before I board the, bur the bus, I turn, staring into my mother's face. I am momentarily back in time, seeing myself 18 years ago, at the same bus stop, staring into my mother's face, continually turning back, waving farewell as I returned to college. That experience which first took me away from our town, from family. Departing was as painful then as it is now. Each movement away makes return harder. Each separation intensifies distance, both physical and emotional. To a Southern black girl from a working class background who had never been on a city bus, who had never stepped on an escalator, who had never traveled by plane, leaving the comfortable confines of a small town Kentucky life to attend Stanford University was not just frightening, it was utterly painful. My parents had not been delighted that I had been accepted and adamantly opposed my going so far from home. At the time, I did not see their opposition as an expression of their fear that they would lose me forever. Like many working class folks, they feared what college education might do to their children's minds even as they unenthusiastically 
acknowledged its importance. They did not understand why I could not attend a college nearby, an all-black college. To them, any college would do. I would graduate, become a school teacher, make a decent living, and a good marriage. And even though they reluctantly and skeptically supported my educational endeavors, they also sub subjected them to constant harsh and bitter critique. It is difficult for me to talk about my parents and their impact on me because they have always felt wary, ambivalent, mistrusting of my intellectual aspirations even as they have been caring and supportive. I want to speak about these contradictions because sorting through them, seeking resolution and reconciliation has been important to me, both as it affects my development as a writer, my effort to be fully self-realized, and my longing to remain close to the family and community that provided the groundwork for much of my thinking, writing, and being. Studying at Stanford, I began to think seriously about class differences, to be materially underprivileged at a university where most folks, with the exception of workers, are materially privileged provokes such thought. Class differences were boundaries no one wanted to face or talk about. It was easier to downplay them, to act as though we were all from privileged backgrounds, to work around them, to confront them privately in the solitude of one's room, or to pretend that just being chosen to study at such an institution meant that those of us who did not come from privilege were already in transition toward privilege. To not long for such transition marked one as rebellious, as unlikely to succeed. It was a kind of treason not to believe that it was better to be identified with the world of material privilege than with the world of the working class, the poor. No wonder our working class parents from poor backgrounds feared our entry into such a world, intuiting perhaps that we might learn to be ashamed of where we had come from, that we might never return home or come back only to lord it over them. Though I hung with students who were supposedly radical and chic, we did not discuss class. I talked to no one about the sources of my shame, how it hurt me to witness the contempt shown the brown-skinned Filipina maids who cleaned our rooms, or later my concern about the hundred dollar a month I paid for a room off campus, which was more than half of what my parents paid for rent. I talked to no one about my efforts to save money, to send a little something home. Yet this, these class realities separated me from fellow students. We were moving in different directions. I did not intend to forget my class background or alter my class allegiance. And even though I received an education designed to provide me with a bourgeoisie sensibility, passive acquiescence was not my only option. I knew that I could resist. I could rebel. I could shape the direction and focus of the various forms of knowledge available to me, even though I sometimes envied the, and longed for greater material advantages, particularly at vacation times when I would be one of the few, if any, students remaining in the dormitory because there was no money for travel. I did not share the sensibility and values of my peers. That was important. Class was not just about money. It was about values, which showed and determined behavior. While I often provided more money, I never needed a new set of beliefs and values. For example, I was profoundly shocked and disturbed when peers would talk about their parents without respect, or would even say that they hated their parents. This was especially troubling to me when it seemed that these parents were caring and concerned. It was often explained to me that such hatred was healthy and normal. To my white middle-class California roommate, I explained the way we were taught to value our parents and their care, to understand that they were not obligated to give us care. She would always shake her head laughing all the while and say, Missy, you will learn that it's different here, that we think differently. She was right. Soon I lived alone, like the one Mormon student who kept to himself as he made a concentrated effort to remain true to his religious beliefs and values. Later, in graduate school, I found that classmates believed lower class people had no beliefs and values. I was silent in such discussions, disgusted by their ignorance. Carol Stax's anthropological study, All Our Kin, was one of the first books I read which confirmed my experiential understanding that within black culture, especially among the working class and poor, particularly in southern states, a value system emerged that was counter-hegemonic, that challenged notions of individualism and private property so important to the maintenance of white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. Black folk created in marginal spaces a world of community and collectively where resources were shared. 
in the preface to Feminist Theory from Margin to Center, I talked about how the point of difference, this marginality, can be the space for the formation of an oppositional worldview. That worldview must be articulated, named if it is to provide a sustained blueprint for change. Unfortunately, there has existed no consistent framework for such naming. Consequently, both the experience of this difference and documentation of it when it occurs gradually loses presence and meaning. Much of what Stack documented about the culture of poverty, for example, would not describe interactions among most Black poor today, irrespective of geographical setting. Since the Black people she described did not acknowledge, if they recognized it in theoretical terms, the oppositional value of their worldview, apparently seeing it more as a survival strategy determined less by conscious efforts to oppose oppressive race and class biases than by circumstance. They did not attempt to establish a framework to transmit their beliefs and values from generation to generation. When circumstances changed, values altered. Efforts to assimilate the values and beliefs of privileged white people presented through media like television undermine and destroy potential structures of opposition. Increasingly young black people are encouraged by the dominant culture and by those black people who internalize the values of this hegemony. To believe that assimilation is the only possible way to survive, to succeed. Without the framework of an organized civil rights or black resistance struggle, individual and collective efforts at black liberation that focus on the primacy of self-definition and self-determination often go unrecognized. It is crucial that those among us who resist and rebel, who survive and succeed, speak openly and honestly about our lives and the nature of our personal struggles, the means by which we resolve and reconcile contradictions. This is no easy task. Within the educational institutions where we learn to develop and strengthen our writing and analytical skills, we also learn to think, write, and talk in a manner that shifts attention away from personal experience. Yet, if we are to reach our people and all people, if we are to remain connected, especially those of us whose familial backgrounds are poor and working class, then we must understand that the telling of one's personal story provides a meaningful example, a way for folks to identify and connect. Combining personal with critical analysis and theoretical perspectives can engage listeners who might otherwise feel estranged, alienated. To speak simply with language that is accessible to as many folks as possible is also important. Speaking about one's personal experience or speaking with simple language is often considered by academics and or intellectuals, irrespective of their political inclinations, to be a sign of intellectual weakness or even anti-intellectualism. Lately, when I speak, I do not stand in place, reading my paper, making little or no eye contact with audiences. But instead, I make eye contact, talk extemporaneously, digress, and address the audience directly. I have been told that people assume I am not prepared, that I am anti-intellectual, unprofessional, a concept that has everything to do with class as it determines actions and behavior, or that I am reinforcing the stereotype of Black people as non-theoretical and gutsy. Such criticism was raised recently by fellow feminist scholars after a talk I gave at Northwestern University at a conference on gender culture politics to an audience that was mainly students and academics. I deliberately chose to speak in a very basic way, thinking especially about the few community folks who had come to hear me. Weeks later, Kumkum Sangari, a fellow participant who shared with me what was said when I was no longer present, and I engaged in quite rigorous critical dialogue about the way my presentation had been perceived primarily by privileged white female academics. She was concerned that I not mask my knowledge of theory, that I not appear anti-intellectual. Her critique compelled me to articulate concerns that I am often silent about with colleagues. I spoke about class allegiance and revolutionary commitments, explaining that it was disturbing to me that intellectual radicals who speak about transforming society, ending the domination of race, sex, class, 
cannot break with behavior patterns that reinforce and perpetuate domination or continue to use as their sole reference point how we might be or are perceived by those who dominate, whether or not we gain their acceptance and approval. This is a primary contradiction which raises the issue of whether or not the academic setting is a place where one can be truly radical or subversive. Concurrently, the use of a language and style of presentation that alienates most folks who are not also academically trained reinforces the notion that the academic world is separate from real life, that everyday world where we constantly adjust our language and behavior to meet diverse needs. The academic setting is separate only when we work to make it so. It is a false dichotomy, which suggests that academics and or intellectuals can only speak to one another, that we cannot hope to speak with the masses. What is true is that we make choices, that we choose our audiences, that we choose voices to hear and voices to silence. If I do not speak in a language that can be understood, then there is little chance for dialogue. This issue of language and behavior is a central contradiction all radical intellectuals, particularly those who are members of oppressed groups, must continually confront and work to resolve. One of the clear and present dangers that exists when we move outside our class of origin, our collective ethnic experience, and enter hierarchical institutions which daily reinforce domination by race, sex, and class, is that we gradually assume a mindset similar to those who dominate and oppress, that we lose critical consciousness because it is not reinforced or affirmed by the environment. We must be ever vigilant. It is important that we know who we are speaking to, who we most want to hear us, who we most long to move, motivate, and touch with our words. When I first came to New Haven to teach at Yale, I was truly surprised by the marked class divisions between black folks, students and professors who identify with Yale and those black folks who work at Yale or in surrounding communities. Style of dress and self-presentation are most often the central markers of one's position. I soon learned that the black folks who spoke on the street were likely to be part of the black community and those who carefully shifted their glance were likely to be associated with Yale. Walking with a black female colleague one day, I spoke to practically every black person in sight, a gesture which reflects my upbringing, an action which disturbed my companion. Since I addressed black folk who were clearly not associated with Yale, she wanted to know whether or not I knew them. That was funny to me. Of course not, I answered. Yet when I thought about it seriously, I realized that in a deep way, I knew them for they and not my companion or most of my colleagues at Yale resemble my family. Later that year, in a black woman support group I started for undergraduates, students from poor backgrounds spoke about the shame they sometimes feel when faced with reality of their connection to working class and poor black people. One student confessed that her father is a street person, addicted to drugs, someone who begs from passerby. She, like other Yale students, turns away from street people often, sometimes showing anger or contempt. She hasn't wanted anyone to know that she was related to this kind of person. She struggles with this, wanting to find a way to acknowledge and affirm this reality, to claim this connection. The group asked me and one another what we do to remain connected, to honor the bonds we have with working class and poor people, even as our class experience alters. Maintaining connections with family and community across class boundaries demands more than just summary recall of where one's roots are where one comes from. It requires knowing, naming, and being ever mindful of those aspects of one's past that have enabled and do enable one's self-development in the present, that sustain and support, that enrich. One must also honestly confront barriers that do exist, aspects of that past that do diminish. My parents' ambivalence about my love for reading led to intense conflict. They, especially my mother, would work to ensure that I had access to books, but then would threaten to burn the books or throw them away if I did not conform to other expectations. Or they would insist that reading too much would drive me insane. Their ambivalence nurtured in me a like uncertainty about the value and significance of intellectual endeavor, which took years for me to unlearn. While this aspect of our class reality was one that wounded and diminished, 
Their vigilant insistence that being smart did not make me a, quote, better or superior person, which often caught on my nerves because I think I wanted to have that sense that it did indeed set me apart and make me better. But that made a profound impression. From them, I learned to value and respect various skills and talents folk might have, not just to value people who read books and talk about ideas. They and my grandparents might say about somebody, now he don't read nor write a lick, but he can tell a story. Or as grandmother would say, call out the hell in words. Empty romanticization of poor or working class backgrounds undermines the possibility of true connection. Such connection is based on understanding difference in experience and perspective and working to mediate and negotiate these terrains. Language is a crucial issue for folk whose movement outside the boundaries of poor and working class backgrounds changes the nature and direction of their speech. Coming to Stanford with my own version of a Kentucky accent, which I think of always as a strong sound quite different from Tennessee or Georgia speech, I learned to speak differently while maintaining the speech of my region, the sound of my family and community. This was, of course, much easier to keep up when I returned home to stay often. In recent years, I have endeavored to use various speaking styles in the classroom as a teacher and find it disconcerts those who feel that the use of a particular patois excludes them as listeners, even if there is translation into the usual acceptable mode of speech. Learning to listen to different voices, hearing different speech challenges, the notion that we must all assimilate, share a single similar talk in educational institutions. Language reflects the culture from which we emerge. To deny ourselves daily use of speech patterns that are common and familiar, that embody the unique and distinctive aspect of ourself, is one of the ways we become estranged and alienated from our past. It is important for us to have as many languages on hand as we can know or learn. It is important for those of us who are Black, who speak in particular patois, as well as standard English, to express ourselves in both ways. Often, I tell students from poor and working class backgrounds that if you believe what you have learned and are learning in schools and universities separates you from your past, this is precisely what will happen. It is important to stand firm in the conviction that nothing can truly separate us from our pasts when we nurture and cherish that connection. An important strategy for maintaining contact is ongoing acknowledgement of the primacy of one's past, of one's background, affirming the reality that such bonds are not severed automatically solely because one enters a new environment or moves toward a different class experience. Again, I do not wish to romanticize this effort, to dismiss the reality of conflict and contradiction. During my time at Stanford, I did go through a period of more than a year when I did not return home. That period was one where I felt that it was simply too difficult to mesh my profoundly disparate realities. Critical reflection about the choice I was making, particularly about why I felt a choice had to be made, pulled me through this difficult time. Luckily, I recognized that the insistence on choosing between the world of family and community and the new world of privileged white people and privileged ways of knowing was imposed upon me by the outside. It is as though a mythical contract had been signed somewhere which demanded of us black folks that once we entered these spheres, we would immediately give up all vestiges of our underprivileged past. It was my responsibility to formulate a way of being that would allow me to participate fully in my new environment while integrating and maintaining aspects of the old. One of the most tragic manifestations of the pressure Black people feel to assimilate is expressed in the internalization of racist perspectives. I was shocked and saddened when I first heard Black professors at Stanford downgrade and express contempt for Black students, expecting us to do poorly, refusing to establish nurturing bonds. At every university I have attended as a student or worked at as a teacher, I have heard similar attitudes expressed with little or no understanding of factors that might prevent brilliant Black students from performing to their full capability. Within universities, there are few educational and social spaces where students who wish to affirm positive ties to ethnicity, to Blackness, to working class backgrounds, can receive affirmation and support. Ideologically, the message is clear. Assimilation is the way to gain acceptance and approval from those in power.
Many white people enthusiastically supported Richard Rodriguez's vehement contention in his autobiography, Hunger of Memory, that attempts to maintain ties with his Chicano background impeded his progress, that he had to sever his ties with community and kin to succeed at Stanford and in the larger world, that family language, in his case Spanish, had to be made secondary or discarded. If the terms of success as defined by the standards of ruling groups within white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy are the only standards that exist, then assimilation is indeed necessary. But they are not. Even in the face of powerful structures of domination, it remains possible for each of us, especially those of us who are members of oppressed and or exploited groups, as well as those radical visionaries who may have race, class, and sex privilege, to define and determine alternative standards, to decide on the nature and extent of compromise. Standards by which one's success is measured, whether student or professor, are quite different for those of us who wish to resist reinforcing the domination of race, sex, and class, who work to maintain and strengthen our ties with the oppressed, with those who lack material privilege, with our families who are poor and working class. When I wrote my first book, Ain't I a Woman? Black Women and Feminism, the issue of class and its relationship to who one's reading audience might be came up for me around my decision not to use footnotes for which I have been sharply criticized. I told people that my concern was that footnotes set class boundaries for readers, determining who a book is for. I was shocked that many academic folks scoffed at this idea. I shared that I went into working class black communities as well as talked with family and friends to survey whether or not they ever read books with footnotes and found that they did not. A few did not know what they were, but most folks saw them as indicating that a book was for college educated people. These responses influenced my decision. When some of my more radical college-educated friends freaked out about the absence of footnotes, I seriously questioned how we could ever imagine revolutionary transformation of society if such a small shift in direction could be viewed as threatening. Of course, many folks warned that the absence of footnotes would make the work less credible in academic circles. This information also highlighted the way in which class informs our choices. Certainly, I did feel that choosing to use simple language, absence of footnotes, etc., would mean I was jeopardizing the possibility of being taken seriously in academic circles. But then this was a political matter and a political decision. It utterly delights me that this has proven not to be the case and that the book is read by many academics as well as by people who are not college educated. Always, our first response when we are motivated to conform or compromise within structures that reinforce domination must be to engage in critical reflection. Only by challenging ourselves to push against oppressive boundaries do we make the radical alternative possible, expanding the realm and scope of critical inquiry. Unless we share radical strategies, ways of rethinking and revisioning with students, with kin and community, with a larger audience, we risk perpetuating the stereotype that We succeed because we are the exception, different from the rest of our people. Since I left home and entered college, I am often asked, usually by white people, if my sisters and brothers are also high achievers. At the root of this question is the longing for reinforcement of the belief in the exception, which enables race, sex, class biases to remain intact. I am careful to separate what it means to be exceptional from a notion of the exception. Frequently, I hear smart black folks from poor and working class backgrounds stressing their frustration that at times family and community do not recognize that they are exceptional. Absence of positive affirmation clearly diminishes the longing to excel in academic endeavors. Yet it is important to distinguish between the absence of basic positive affirmation and the longing for continued reinforcement that we are special. Usually, liberal white folks will willingly offer continual reinforcement of us as exceptions, as special. This can be both patronizing and very seductive, since we often work in situations where we are isolated from other black folks, we can easily begin to feel that encouragement from white people is the primary or only source of support and recognition. Given the internalization of racism, it is easy to view this support as more validating and legitimizing than similar support from black people. Still, nothing takes the place of being valued and appreciated by one's own, by one's family and community. 
We share a mutual and reciprocal responsibility for affirming one another's success. Sometimes we have to talk to our folks about the fact that we need their ongoing support and affirmation that is unique and special to us. In some cases, cases, we may never receive desired recognition and acknowledgement of specific achievements from kin. Rather than seeing this as a basis for estrangement, for severing connection, it is useful to explore other sources of nourishment and support. I do not know that my mother's mother ever acknowledged my college education except to ask me once, how can you live so far away from your people? Yet she gave me sources of affirmation and nourishment, sharing the legacy of her quilt making, of family history, of her incredible ways with words. Recently, when our father retired after more than 30 years of work as a janitor, I wanted to pay tribute to his experience, to identify links between his work and my own as writer and teacher, reflecting on our family past. I recalled ways he had been an impressive example of diligence and hard work, approaching tasks with a seriousness of concentration. I work to mirror and develop with a discipline I struggle to maintain. Sharing these thoughts with him keeps us connected, nurtures our respect for each other, maintaining a space, however large or small, where we can talk. Open, honest communication is the most important way we maintain relationships with kin and community as our class experience and backgrounds change. It is as vital as the sharing of resources. Often, financial assistance is given in circumstances where there is no meaningful contact. However helpful, this can also be an expression of estrangement and alienation. Communication between Black folks from various experiences of material privilege was much easier when we were all in segregated communities sharing common experiences in relation to social institutions. Without this grounding, we must work to maintain ties and connections. We must assume greater responsibility for making and maintaining contact, connections that can shape our intellectual visions and inform our radical commitments. The most powerful resource any of us can have as we study and teach in university settings is full understanding and appreciation of the richness, beauty, and primacy of our familial and community backgrounds. Maintaining awareness of class differences, nurturing ties with the poor and working class people who are our most intimate kin, our comrades in struggle, transforms and enriches our intellectual experience. Education as a practice of freedom becomes not a force which fragments or separates, but one that brings us closer, expanding our definitions of home and community.